How many times have you been in a relationship where you sat down and you asked your lady, how do you want to be protected? What does being protected look like to you? What's up, real ones? Welcome back to the Relationship Podcast, where we're bringing the real back to relationships. Yes, sir. I'm Asha Steele. And I'm Devin Steele. And we're so excited that you guys are tuning in today with us. Yeah, because after last week's episode, I don't know why y'all would. <laughs> what? Seriously, I, I don't know. Look, you, your face then froze and everything. Like, yo, is he joking? Do we need to start this over? No. That's how I wanted to start this off. Okay. Because last week, right, we put out an episode... Mm-hmm. That I wasn't necessarily proud of Not because I don't think that the topic was good Or the content was good Or the conversation was good Is that I felt like the audio was trash mm-hmm. On your behalf yeah, I didn't need you to do all this I was I about to take accountability Dorn If you want to point it out I'm going to point Protect out. me <laughs> If this was this podcast Protect me just throw me out there. We could have blamed it on somebody else. I mean, you, you put it out there. I'm just saying. No, they heard, what, they what I'm saying is, clips. listen, we don't, I don't, matter of fact, I don't mind wearing headphones for this podcast, but Asha just thinks that it makes it visually whack. Not appealing to, right. to me. So we don't wear, wear uh, headphones. So once we check the audio, I take the headphones off and we just on go mode, Mm -hmm. right? And when you do that, for those of you who may be thinking about starting a podcast, it's a little bit dangerous, especially if you don't have somebody monitoring the audio because anything can go wrong. Yeah. So when I was listening to the playback last week, I kept hearing like, for some reason, it felt like I was so far away from the microphone Mm -hmm. and I was right on the microphone. And then my voice would go out some. And I tried to do as much as I could in the editing process to boost my voice and try to make it sound good. Because when you listen to podcasts, like, it got to sound good. Because who else? Why would you want to listen to something that's just, like, irritating? It's like that fly just flying past your ear. Like, it just does something. That's how I felt. But I was like, yo, we got to put this out and hopefully, you know, they don't come at us too much. And y'all didn't. I appreciate that. So I came up myself for y'all. But just to let y'all know, man, we care so much about y'all and your experience that we got rid of those microphones that we normally have and we went and cashed out and got some real microphones. So if the audio is bad with this, I don't know what to tell y'all because we done spent like a stack on our, our, uh, I don't even know what it's called, on the the Rodecaster, whatever it is called, the the interface. Yeah, soundboard. And then we just spent like, you know, a stack on microphones. So the audio got to be perfect. If not, I don't know what to tell y'all. But just know that we thinking of y'all and we understand that. That was kind of rough to get through last week. So hopefully this will be better for y'all. Yes. I, is that your keeping a real moment? Because it sounds sure. like, yeah, I mean, you just went straight sure, that, to it. Sure. That, that's my just keeping a real moment. Because okay. I was... I was upset, man. Like, I don't want to give y'all that type of quality audio. So, you know. Yeah. Well, you guys. I should didn't care. Just to let y'all know. Since she blamed me for the poor audio I last week. Cared. She didn't care. She was like, put the put the episode out. You about to I go mean, buy new microphones? The they don't need new out. microphones. We had to put the content out. I didn't say we have to get. Well, I said why. Because I didn't know it was that, you know, bad. But, you know, we had to put the content out. We be. Not we be, but we have left y'all hanging. You know, some people come on like, where's our episode this week? Like, we are missing y'all. Like, come on. So I'm like, no, we have to make sure that we're on schedule. We get these episodes out because we have our real ones out there wanting to hear from us. Right. And so it's like, you know what? They're going to grind with us. They're going to struggle with us through this episode. Excuses. (laughs) <laughs> Excuses, no. y'all. That's all so, she gave me, y'all. We got it out, you guys. Y'all enjoy that episode. But like Devin said, we're trying to come at you, come with y'all correct this episode. Yeah. So hopefully, like he said, the audio sounds way better. And that um, wasn't my just keeping a real moment. Oh, okay. I got another one. Okay, go ahead. You ready? I'm ready. Your you new ready? haircut is sexy. Oh, 
thank you. She came in here with them layers (laughs) just flowing down her back, and I was like, okay, okay. Me. I had to switch it up, you know. Why did you have to switch it up? Because I think one, it's important to you know change up your look to make you feel good about yourself, but also to make your your partner be like you know see a little spiciness. When I came in the house, he was like, "Come in the office." (laughs) (laughs) Dead it, dead serious. But no, but yeah, Arya's taking a nap. I can't come in the office. Let's mess up this hairstyle. I cannot, but. Let's yes. put it to the test. I had to switch it up a little bit. I was thinking about doing some color, like brighten it up a little bit more. I refreshed my color, you guys. But we're going to do it in stages. We're not going to do too much too soon. You but. wasn't nervous? Because you've been growing your hair out for a very long time. And to mm-hmm. allow somebody to put scissors to your hair, that didn't make you nervous? I mean, it didn't make me nervous because if some of y'all know or follow me on social media. I just went and chopped a bang like in November because mm. I have these phases from me being a retired hairstylist. It's oh, just like man. I get this urge, like I need the change. I have to <laughs> switch it up. And three years, I mean, it's been like three years since I actually cut my hair, my actual hair. I had trims here and there, but I haven't really had a cut. So mm. it was like it's time. I'm just glad I didn't go for like the bob that I had in my mind. Yeah. You know, I just was like, yeah, let's just get some long layers. I still want to wear it long. I still want to continue to grow my hair out, but I just wanted to switch it up a little bit. So it looks good, y'all. For those of y'all just you. listen, listening audio, it y'all looks good. Go watch. Y'all don't gotta go watch because I don't need y'all looking YouTube. at my woman. <laughs> so don't keep listening and just take my word for it. I can't. But you guys, okay. So before we get into the my keeping a real moment and um, oh, you got one for us today. That, yeah. First of all, can we just round of applause? Okay, round of applause. Clap it up, clap it up, because we are celebrating a milestone today. Okay, what milestone this is we celebrating? Fifty episodes. Okay, this yes, is episode sir. fifty that we have. I didn't put even realize out, that okay? until I looked at the board. <laughs> you know, we have put out fifty episodes. You guys, um, long time coming. We still, you know, we got way more to go. Fifty more on top of fifty more on top of fifty more. But this is we a should huge have what milestone. over a hundred. By this year, if we stick to our schedule, yeah, yeah, so yeah, that's so, just great. That just shows you the type of like discipline mm-hmm. or dedication we're trying to have to this this year, where we actually double it. Yes, in one year, it's a big undertaking. But I know, you know, once I finish school, this I can say next month because it's almost yeah next month. Close once enough. I finish school next month, we're gonna have. I'm not gonna say a lot more time, uh, but we're gonna have enough time to. Yeah, really hone in. And a lot of great a lot of great content, a lot of great insight that we're going to be able to use. When I'm telling man, I'm telling y'all, like, I'm just telling y'all. Y'all find out when it happens. Yeah. Well, I'm excited. I know you guys are excited, so just get prepared because, like Devin said, we're coming with the fire in the next couple of months, okay? But to keep it real with y'all, okay? So we got a lot to discuss about um things that have been just going on on social media the past couple of days but there's one thing that stuck out to me um and I was watching it was a clip I believe I didn't see the whole live but it was a clip from uh Koi Lee Ray I'm saying her name right Koi Lee Ray and Nicki Minaj live right and Barb's, I ain't a part of this so uh <laughs> no it's not anything <laughs> negative you know it's just my thoughts um, but so I was watching this clip from the live or whatever, and it wasn't necessarily like a bad live because I believe they were promoting a song that they actually have together. Right. And I guess before Nicki Minaj had stood up for her when people were coming at her or something or what, along the lines of that. So the whole live overall, I don't think was negative, but there was this section, um, or like clip of the lie where Nicki Mon- or Coily Ray was basically expressing how she has received so much hate, you know, in the industry or from social media or whatever. And Nicki Minaj is like, kind of like cut her off and was just like, can you girls stop saying y'all experience hate? Y'all have not experienced hate like she has basically. 
And I was a little bit taken back by that. I, I scrolled through some comments and some other people felt the same way. But I just think that it's important for us, especially when you're that of like a mentor or an older generation that's been through so much, you know, trials and tribulations and struggles and hates that you are mindful of how you, you know, talk or mentor the younger generation. Because mm. granted, her level of hate, you may not think is that extreme compared to yours, but to kind of downplay someone's experience is hurtful in a sense. It's like you're not able to validate her um, struggles and her hate because you want to magnify what you've been through, right? right? And I don't think it should be a comparison, contrast, like, oh, I have more hate than you type of thing. It's like, you know what? Yes, we both experience hate. Maybe it's not on the same level. Maybe it is because we truthfully don't know what she has experienced um, throughout her journey and her career. But I just was a little bit taken back by that because I feel like that can really make someone feel like, oh, well, what I'm going through is not that big of a deal. Right. And it definitely is a big deal because social media nowadays and the way people attack people and bully and just come at individuals like crazy is a form of hate. And it, it causes people to unfortunately do things um, that they can't turn back from. Right? right. And so I think just being able to acknowledge that, you know, OK, this person is going through this experience to acknowledge their experience and encourage them and give them words of uh, wisdom instead of being like, you know what? Y'all stop saying y'all. Y'all don't know what hate is. I experience hate. Yeah. I don't think it takes away from your struggles by acknowledging their struggles. You know, I'm a barb. I plead the fifth. It's Sir, like, nah, bye. Nah, nah. <laughs> I'm not a barb. I do respect their craft, though. But uh, no, I get what you're saying. I, I and I. I especially agree with that when you're in a place of being a mentor. Mm -hmm. Like we have to be able to understand that not everybody struggles is the same mm -hmm. and that everybody has a different capacity in order to endure struggle, challenges, trauma, stressors and all that. So what may not be hate to you or that stressful to you can be stressful to somebody else. Yeah. So when you're in that type of position, it should be more or less of here. I'm a shoulder you can lean on and talk to and let it out. And I won't try to minimize your experience just because I feel like I've been through worse. Mm -hmm. Like I'm willing to just recognize that. And maybe in a later conversation, I will bring up what I have been through so that you may be able to take some perspective from it. But in that moment, regardless of how I may think, I'm going to embrace you coming to me to share what you're going through. So I, I think that's that's really important. But it's all. I don't know. I, I think that we're all just trying to work through things that we may not properly know how to handle those type of conversations. Yeah, especially um, like I, I felt like all of us, um, if you look at just generation after generation, our history. Like all of us have experienced some form of hate. And if we look at our ancestors, they could say, oh, well, what they went through is not nearly the same experience of what we go through. Right. Yeah. But I don't hear a lot of people saying that. Right. It's like they understand that their struggles pave the way for the next generation and will hopefully pave the way that for the next generation. So they don't have to experience those same struggles that they had to experience. Right. Yeah. So I think that should be the overall goal is that, you know what, unfortunately, I did have to experience all this. Hey, I did have to experience all the, the struggle and everything that I went through, but it got me to the point that I, I am because mm -hmm. like she is, she's at the top of her game. Like she is who she is, like you said. So I think just being able to understand that and say, you know what, even if I had to go through it, it helps somebody else along the way. So, And, and I know there's probably some people who who going to listen to this who like, it's coming over from the shade room because they saw my comment today and be like, yo, you a hypocrite, Devin. Because I touched on something like this. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm going to explain a little bit because it's, it's, it kind of goes into our topic um, for today. Mm 
And I don't know, should I go into this now or do you want to do the message from a real one? Let's get into the message from Just the real one. Just remind me because you know how my brain be all over the place. <laughs> remind me of what I was about to say. Okay. Matter so, of fact, should I just touch on it now and then go to the message from the real one before we go to the topic? I mean, if you some, want to. Yeah, let me just do that. Circle back. Let me do that. So I, I kept, like I continuously see people post about how traumatized they are from what happened at the Oscars with Will. And it just really has me thinking. Mm -hmm. And it's not like I don't want to minimize people's trauma because, like I said earlier, we all have different capacities in order to endure challenges and stressors and trauma. So I recognize that this could have been a very traumatic event for somebody who hasn't built up that capacity in order to see something like but what it made me realize is that although it was shocking, like I was shocked to see that, I had no trauma response to that. Like it wasn't a traumatic event to me mm -hmm. because of how I grew up. Like I've watched people get killed. I've, I've wore T-shirts with my friends on it after they've passed away. Like, I've had to duck bullets at parties. And at a certain point, those that wasn't even traumatic to me. Mm -hmm. It was just, this is just how life is. Mm -hmm. And I've always grown up that way. But when I see the response from a lot of people that is saying that the Oscars was traumatic to them, I'm not saying it shouldn't be. I'm saying... Darn, am I that desensitized that something that is traumatic to a lot of people and not to me, something I need to work through? Yeah. Have I cut that part off of me? Because, again, I get it. It's shocking, mm -hmm. but it's not traumatizing. And every day there's kids growing up in the hood who see the same things that I saw growing up and they lack the resources in order to deal with it. Mm -hmm. People just say they got thick skin or they'll get over it. They're strong. But it's like if y'all are having this type of response and y'all know what kids are going through in the inner city, why isn't there more resources to help them get through that? When I know there's going to be resources to help people get through what they just saw. They're going to try to make sure that everybody's okay from what they just saw. And all I'm saying is, yes, those people who feel traumatized by that, they deserve the resources and the help. Mm -hmm. I'm not arguing that. But these kids who are seeing things that are way worse, where's the help? That's all I'm saying. That's a great question. Um, and like you said, it, it leads into uh, our topic of discussion for today. So we can touch further on that because it, it makes it doesn't make sense, but it makes a lot of sense in the way that you worded it of why isn't it uh, provided for. Like you said, people who are living those experiences day to day and. Kind of, it becomes the norm in a sense, whereas like you are desensitized to those experiences. So you look at something where someone else is saying, oh, this is so traumatic. And it's just like, you know what I went through? So. Yeah, and, it, yeah. and it's not even to tell them that they shouldn't be traumatized, but it's just eye opening for me to like, yo, maybe you need to dig a little bit deeper to why that wasn't traumatic to you. Maybe people who who don't, didn't really feel anything when they saw that, should ask themselves, have I cut that part of me off? Yeah. Where things that should be triggering or traumatizing, is, it's not that. Yeah. So just, just food for thought. But let's go ahead and get into this message. Message! <laughs> so it says, hi, guys. So I just started listening to your podcast, and I love it. Thank you. Well, thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question. I think. Well, I hope because we're reading it, right? 
I have been married for five years and my husband told me a few months ago that he cheated on me almost a year ago. Oh, I could not believe it. <laughs> I mean, I never thought this would happen to me. I am and was hurt by this. So after we talked about it and why it all happened, it the conversation was really deep. Um, he was very remorseful, but then he seemed to be distant when he asked, why haven't I come around to him or really express how the issues are affecting me? He wants me to come on to him and still try to heal from what he did. And I'm so confused and I'm debating if we should seek counseling or not. That shouldn't be up for debate. Not at all. Um, so, of course, I feel like the answer is yes. Y'all should seek counseling. Um, because that's a lot to go through. We shared our experiences on episode 15. Y'all know I know what episode yeah, it I'm, is. <laughs> Jesus. I was about to say, go back to an episode to to listen to. In yes. 15. Okay. We on 50, you guys. Episode 15. But, <laughs> <laughs> but no, we share our experiences. And I think you definitely, for one, I feel like he has to... um understand that your healing process is your healing process right is is no time frame where he can put where he specifically can put on it to say oh you should feel like this or you should be you know wanting to come back on to him wanting to show certain emotions because you're still processing all of that even though it may have taken place a year ago just finding out about it it hurts the same as if you found out and it happened today and so I think that he has to understand that your your grieving and healing process from that information, he can't really control. And so if you are distant, if you are um, not wanting to be affectionate or y'all just not connecting, he has to understand why that is, right? And allow you that space to really process things and heal because a lot of times People, you know, feel like, oh, I said what I needed to say. I got it out. I, I feel bad for it. What can we do? And they want to kind of speed up the process of how we can get back or how mm -hmm. we can get over. And it's like, no, I need to process these things on my own. I need to figure out some things because how I'm dealing with it is not how you're going to deal with it. And so I think allowing that space to really um, allow for you to understand what you're going through is helpful. Um, so I think counseling would be a huge factor in helping y'all to get over that so that you can have a, a space where y'all both feel like y'all can communicate, um, and be vulnerable and express what you need to go through and have the resources and tools to say, you know what, we can get through this, we can work through this, but it's going to take some work. Yeah. And I, and I think that you brought up a, a great point, right? Because I think that when, you're the person that's coming clean. You're taking a huge weight off your shoulders because clearly it has been weighing down on you. Mm -hmm. So you think that you're just free from all of this mm -hmm. and then you're supposed to move forward, not understanding that you're putting the weight on your partner now. Yeah. Like the weight is off of you. You spoke your truth. You got your skeletons out the closet, but now your partner has to deal with that weight now. And like you said, you do go through a grieving process because now you're grieving who you thought that your partner was and now having to come up with a new idea of who this person truly is. And I think that when me and you went through what we went through, that was the toughest part for me to understand. Or that's the one thing that you said to me that hurt the most. When you said, you're not who I thought you were. Mm -hmm. I said, oh my goodness. <laughs> that, that hit me in my heart. And it really just opened my eyes to the situation. Like, who do I really want to be? Mm -hmm. Do I want the people I love and care about to not be able to depend on me or to not know who I truly am at my core? So this was a tough process that we went through. There was a process where I should not want to be bothered with me. Not at all. Nah, she didn't want to touch me. She didn't want to do nothing. And I had to be okay with that. Mm -hmm. I had to give her her space to go through it. Like it, it's a tricky thing because you don't know if you're pushing too hard or if you're falling back too much. Yeah. 
And that's why I think that counseling helps out a lot with that because then now you have an outside perspective to help you work through these problems because y'all are two people who probably never been through nothing like this. Or if you have, you probably haven't dealt with it in a healthy way. Right. Not in the type of way that you're going to need to in order to have a relationship that lasts a long, a lifetime. So that's why I think that counseling is truly important. Even if you're uncertain, if you want to move forward, it helps bring clarity. It gives you the tools if you want to make it work. And it can give you the tools on what to do if y'all don't move forward, especially if y'all have children together, how y'all can better co-parent um, as y'all are going through this transition. But I'm sorry that you have to go through this because I saw what my wife went through when she went through that. Um, so my advice to, the, to, to your husband would just be, Man up. Like, there's consequences to our actions. We don't make decisions and live with them. We make decisions and live with the consequences. These are the consequences of your actions. So you can't try to make her speed up her healing process just because you're uncomfortable. Because right now she's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Right now she's grieving what she once thought, who she once thought you were, and trying to wrap her head around um, a new reality for herself and for your marriage. Yes. Um. So getting into today's discussion, you guys. Yeah. Um. And and we don't even want to focus so much on the the actual act. No. Right. Like we feel like y'all know what we talked about. We brought up early where we're talking about Will Smith smacking Chris Rock at the Oscars. Um, but we want to approach this from a relationship standpoint. Like, mm -hmm. what happened, happened. There's enough people who actually talked about that. But I think that it brings an opportunity for us to discuss a real thing in marriages and relationships. So, of course, this is going to be a sensitive topic. Um, but we don't stray away from tough topics. This is the place where. We want y'all to be able to come to to discuss. And I tell you right off the bat, we don't got the answer, Sway, at all. But I think that the discussion can help bring a lot of healing and understanding to the relationships that are out there. Like, that's my hope for this podcast. I don't want to answer how we should protect black women or how we should protect our wives or how men can show up more for their women. I, I don't want to be the person that answers that question, but I do want to start that discussion so that y'all can have the conversations in your own household and bring some clarity and answers to your own relationships. Okay. So you want to go ahead and start? Yeah. So, Man, I, I don't even know where to start from. It, it's so much um, to start from. And, and and I would start by saying this, right? I've I seen a lot of different perspectives from people. From men, I saw people talk about how Will did what he needed to do. That he needed to show the world on that stage that a black woman and a wife will not be disrespected. Like it won't be tolerated. It needed to send a message to the youth that this is how you stand up for black women or for women. Mm -hmm. And for all of our listeners out there that are not black, we all inclusive of all different backgrounds, races, but tonight we're going to be talking to our people. Mm -hmm. Right. I saw a lot of people say that I saw a lot of women say, that Will did what he needed to do. My man need to step up and do that. When I have a husband, he needs to step up and do that. And it's tough because I remember a few years ago, me and Asha, we went to the movies and we were watching a Tyler Perry movie. I can't remember what it's called. Do you know? It's like Temptations of Something. I, I can't remember what it's called, but it's with uh, who? 
Um, dang, put me on the spot. I know it's um. What's the guy name? Lance Gross. Lance Gross and then Journey Smollett, right? I I don't know. Um, yeah, I think so. But it was with them, and I remember one scene in a movie where he was walking with his girl, and like this these group of guys came up. And started like whistling, I think it was, Mm -hmm. and called the girl a B, and he didn't do anything about it. And I remember later in the movie, she complained to him and was like, You just gonna let them disrespect me like that? You're not gonna stick up for me? And she ended up leaving him. Mm -hmm. And I looked at that moment because I'm thinking to myself, like, Yo, what's more important for us to get home safely? Or for me to allow my ego to get the best of me and prove to you how much I love you by fighting three men. And it's only me. So I looked at Ash and I was like, yo, what would you want me to do in that situation? Because I don't think that we ever asked that question to our partners. How will you feel protected in that moment? Mm -hmm. What do you want me to do? And I think that that, it's very important because when we're putting out this message to to people, it's like what we saw go down at the Oscars is not what happens in the streets. If you go smack somebody, it is definitely going to escalate. And some people may end up dead or in jail. So if women want to step, want their men to step up and protect them in that way with violence, to feel protected, how protected are you going to feel if your man is dead or in jail? Mm-hmm. Because these are real life scenarios. Because in fact, I got a homeboy who's in jail right now, recently, just went to jail. Good dude, solid dude, thorough dude. Take care of kids. He's a stand up guy. I don't associate with people who are not stand up men. But he went to protect somebody he loved and cared about and things went left and now he's in jail. When he had no intentions on it being violent. Mm -hmm. So these are real things that we got to talk about, especially when we're telling our youth, yo, this is how you protect a black woman because there's way, there's a lot more ways to protect black women than being violent. Like some situations cause for you to be violent And I'm all with that. Like if it ever came to that scenario, I'm with going to the furthest extent to protect my family, hands down. But there's some situations that cause you, that requires you to be intellectual and to use your brain in that situation so that you get your point across, but then you also get your family home. Because that's what a real man and protector does. He doesn't allow his ego to get the best of him, but he makes the smart decisions in that moment that gets his family back home safely. Yeah. Um, so I'm just rewind a little bit because I feel like it's it's a lot of key points to touch on. Um, uh, with first being that understanding, like you said, it's different environments, right? So, of course, unfortunately, like you were saying before. Within certain, you know, communities, we see things like this happen, right? So it's not, we don't look at it in a certain way. So when we were watching the Oscars, it was a shock factor that it even happened, right? That because it was just like, to us, we don't know Will personally. We don't know any of them personally, but just from seeing him. Sometimes I feel like um, I don't know myself <laughs> personally. You you feel like you know his character. So it was shocking to see that happen. And to see him, in a sense, step out of his character of who he is as Will Smith, not playing any type of role, but who he is as that man, right? And so I feel like that was the shocking part the most, right? Then it was trying to break down and understand why he was there, right? Because everyone had their perspective of the situation, like you were saying. Everybody was analyzing it. Everyone can say, oh, well, this is that. And this is the reason why, but only those who are included in in that close area really know why all of that took place and why it escalated the way that it did. 
Um, and I feel like it's really about, like you were saying, us having a, a conversation and understanding of what is necessary and the time that is necessary. I think that is a huge factor that's missing um, when people are talking about the incident is the time and place of how things are happening, right? Because like you said, the Oscars is not where we grew up, okay? So if you think that you're going to just walk up and smack someone and it's just going, you're going <laughs> to turn your back and walk away and nothing's going to happen, no. No. And so I think that was the biggest thing because it's it's the confusion of, yes, as black women, we want to be protected. Yes, as black women, we want our men to stand up for us. We want to feel like, you know what, we, we're being put down, but no, someone has our back, right? And I understand that feeling, but it, it takes a certain level of understanding to say, not like this. Right. Because as much as I want you to stand up for me, I don't want you to risk your life standing up for me. Because if I need you to stand up for me the next time and you're not there to protect me, what am I going to do? Right. Mm -hmm. And so we have to understand that because without going too deep into why exactly or what happened, because, you know, we're, we weren't really there. But it's just like. To look at the situation, there are so many factors that you have to put in. Right. I feel like. You have to hold both sides accountable because it's like you, even if you are in a certain environment where you're not being mindful of how you're speaking about someone else's woman or wife, in a sense, you know, that can lead to something else. And we understand that on that, that stage, um, in a certain, you know, career and all those aspects is like, okay, this comes with the territory in a sense, but I think every one's actions has consequences right and so like you were saying granted you you look at will's actions and understand the consequences and how it can affect people outside of that environment but you also have to look at uh chris rock's actions and how there's consequences for those actions outside of that environment as well so i feel like both sides have to hold uh each other accountable to say you know what wrong is wrong, right is right, and we should have done things differently, right? And you hear everyone talking about, you know, what the story is, what it was about, what made, you know, Jada feel the way that she feel, and we don't know because we're not her. And mm -hmm. until she comes out and say exactly what it was, we can only assume. But it's just being mindful of how you're talking to people, how you're treating people, how you're handling situations, because things could escalate and go left quickly and not be like how they turned out, how everyone saw that night, right? Yeah. And I think that's the biggest thing that we have to understand is what do you want for yourself? Because we can sit up here and say, like you said, we grew up in the same area. We can sit up here and say, if we were in that predicament and we were outside, you know, you, you're at a club, you're at a lounge, you're at a bar, you're at a, a sports event, and someone says something disrespectful or someone comes off disrespectful to your woman or whatever, you will want to defend her, right? You will want to say something. Most men will. Mm -hmm. But in the back of your mind, you know, this may come with something that I don't necessarily want to have to deal with. Yeah. So it's like you have to make that decision in a split second. And unfortunately, because of how people are we can't control how people react and the things that they want to do things can change in a split second that can alter and shape your life in a way that you don't even want yeah it's crazy because growing up i would have did something that will did i would have did what will did mm -hmm. right but like with age should come maturity and I'm not that same hot-headed person anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, I use my wisdom to make decisions. I don't move off emotions, right? I allow myself to process certain things. And I think when I, because I, I had to really do some thinking when I saw this. But it's like when you're growing up in the hood, you always taught that the only thing you have 
is your respect. Like when you grow up and you don't have nothing, you feel like your life is worthless. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that you do have and which people put in your mind is your respect. You're willing to die over that. Yeah. But as I got older and I got a family, I realized that my respect is not everything that I got. And I don't have to die over it mm -hmm. because I don't need your respect, especially if I don't respect you. I don't need your respect. As long as you don't cross that line where you're not putting my family in physical harm, mm -hmm. I'm going to have to think about what I do, how I react to whatever it is that you're doing. Because like I said, when I walk out that door, my main goal over making money, over getting done whatever I need to get done, is to make it back home to my family. Mm -hmm. That's it. If I'm out with y'all, my main goal is not to prove how much of a macho man I am. I know what I'm about. I don't have to prove that to nobody. My goal is to get y'all home safely and if somebody's not physically harming us or threatening us in that way i'm not going to do something to put us in that situation yeah because if i react who knows what may happen to y'all as well if things go left mm -hmm. but i had to think about it even more and ask myself why was i like this growing up why are some men out there cheering on what Will did? Why are some women out there cheering on what Will did? Mm -hmm. And again, I don't know this to be true. I don't know this to be a fact. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a psychologist that deals with trauma. I study positive psychology, which is the strengths in communities. And people mm -hmm. I don't really deal with trauma but I can't help but think when I look back at our history and I look back at slavery right women were raped by slave masters in front of their husbands do you know how degrading and traumatizing that is that you're being raped and your husband can't and didn't do anything to save you or stop that from happening? So now we're out of the slavery. But that is imprinted in your brain. It's passed on through pathology. You have a genetic disposition for this. So now when we're out of this situation, you're thinking to yourself, I literally died internally while this thing happened to me. And you didn't do anything about it. So now you got to be willing to put it all on the line to protect me. So when you see a man get violent, when you see a man say, I'm willing to die for you, that's how much I love to you. It's like you're finally making up for all the pain we went through before. So I get it from that aspect. And from the man point of view, you had to watch your wife be raped. And you couldn't do nothing about it. But you, so you learned to suppress it. And now, the only way you know how to react is with anger. That I got to go out there and I got to prove with violence how much I love you, how much I care about you. Because that sh they stripped me of that before. Now I got to show you what I'm capable of doing. 
So this stuff is just way deeper than people just having different perspectives. Like we went through some things as a community, as a culture that people don't want to talk about. So don't just say that 400 years or all this time has passed, get over it. No, there's things that we're still dealing with because of what our ancestors went through in the past. Don't get it twisted. But we have to start making a shift because what we're doing, it ain't going to work. There has to be better ways that we can protect our women, our black women, without being violent. Unless the situation causes for us to be violent. Yeah, so I feel like what was interesting to me, I feel like, and we talked about it, that when the incident happened, because it was so shocking, like it almost seemed like it wasn't even real, right? And I don't know if people there felt the same way, Because it was like, like a lot of people saying, oh, it was scripted or it wasn't what it was, but it didn't really hit me that what had actually happened. And you can see some of the people faces in the audience the same way until he said what he said to him once he was seated. Right. And it spoke volumes because it showed how powerful his words were where the audience, even with him walking away from doing it, laughed because they may have thought, oh, this is just something that they put in here, right? But when you heard his words, when you heard the pain in his voice when he was saying it, you understood what he was saying and what he meant and that it wasn't a game. And I think that that spoke volumes more than him physically hitting him. Because even him reacting on the stage was just like, oh, I'm shocked that it happened. But now I'm looking at you like, wow. And you can see his reaction the same way when he said what he said, how it triggered in him, Chris Rock on the stage. Oh, this is serious. So I think even in that situation, what you said, uh, how we can protect people like you are, are, well, men protecting their women, but overall, is it doesn't have to be physical, like you said, if it doesn't cause for it. Like, you can get your point across just verbally. If you feel like someone is assaulting, insulting you and not assaulting you, attacking your character or attacking you verbally without you attacking them physically. And I think once we're able to get to that place it shows how powerful we truly are because the whole audience was silent when he said that it it seemed like the whole and i don't even know how huge the room was but i'm pretty sure it was huge was just quiet and like literally hearing him say that i felt chills like i was there like oh this is not a game and this man is not to be played with so i think That is the biggest thing because, granted, like you said, there are situations that cause where you need to make sure that you're protecting your your woman or your family physically, right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there's times where that has to happen. But in those moments, like this situation where it doesn't cause for you to get to that point, there's ways that you can handle it and say, you know what? This not what we doing. And you're going to respect me. You're going to respect mine. And this is how we're going to handle it. And I think that's what we really have. It has, like you said, the starting the conversation of what it is that we're seeking as women and how our men can deliver. Yeah. How we can communicate to make sure that we're both feeling protected and heard and understood. Right. Because that's that's the key to making sure that we're on a certain level. And it's not even just about relationship wise, as far as 
us being together, us being married, you protecting your your wife. But it's about protecting us as a whole, as a community. Because like you said, if you understand as a black man on that stage, the harm that you're bringing to another black woman, you're going to be mindful of that. Because you know that you have a duty to protect her. Because you come from a black woman. So I think just having that, like you said, being able to unpack that trauma and to realize that your actions are, it's not just about you as the individual because your actions affect other people that you don't even realize that that it impacts them and affects them. So when we're mindful of the things that we're doing, where we're, where we show empathy and just compassion for others in situations where it's just like, you know what, if someone was to do that to me or mine, I wouldn't be feeling that. Mm -hmm. When you look at it from that perspective, instead of just being your own, your, your own ways and your own viewpoints of, you know what, this is what I'm doing. This is my profession. This is my career. This is, it's not that, that serious. When you look at it outside of your own ideas, you're able to understand things differently and you're able to analyze things and make better choices so that you can avoid certain situations from happening. Yeah. I don't know, man. It just, it's a lot. It's a lot to, to unpack in that situation. Um, because I, I get the anger that somebody could feel from that situation. And I, I'm not just give my, my quick perspective real quick. And I'm going to tie this into why I'm even going to give my perspective on this. But what I saw, and this is only what I saw, because a lot of people are saying he reached a breaking point. Because you went from being an icon to butt of jokes on the internet. And I, I know that has to be tough. And I know Will has talked about before, especially in this book, how he used laughter and comedy to get through tough times. Um, so we don't know in that 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 instance whether he initially started laughing to help him deal with the frustration he felt internally, or if he thought it was a funny joke, or if he snapped because he saw Jada's reaction to it. And as a man, you know, if I don't do something to make up for this laugh, I ain't going to hear the end of this. Yeah. If I don't do something to show her that I'm here to protect her, I'm not going to hear the end of this. So it's a lot that could have went on in that situation. I say all this to say I can get how angry you get in that situation because I remember when Leah was battling cancer, the stuff I had to deal with online with people calling her alien and talking about her. I was extremely mad. I ain't will. I can't laugh things off like that. Like I was extremely pissed. Like if I saw you in person, I don't know what I would have done because I wasn't that mature yet going through that situation made me more mature because I saw how people will say certain things to you just to trigger you, mm -hmm. just to get a response out of you, just to trick you off the streets. So I grew up a lot in that situation where I said, yo, I'm not going to allow nobody to make me do something dumb because imagine if you was in person, I would have did something to you. You done tricked me off the streets. Now I can't be in the hospital supporting my daughter. Mm -hmm. So that situation taught me how to think with my mind more than think with my hands or think with anything else. But unfortunately, and fortunately, people don't have to go through what we went through. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to share some perspective because men, if you go off the handle, there ain't nobody there to protect your woman no more. There ain't nobody there to protect your kids no more. So we can't tell you what's going to make your partner feel protected because everybody goes through different traumas that shapes the idea of what protection truly is. Yeah. So that's not for us to sit up here and answer that question. 
It's to spark the conversation. Because most of the times we don't have that conversation. Think about it. How many times have you been in a relationship? Matter of fact, don't think about it because I don't want to know. (laughs) So I'm going to ask the listeners. How many times have you been in a relationship where you sat down and you asked your lady, how do you want to be protected? What does being protected look like to you? Ladies, how many times have you sat down with your man and was like, this is what I need from you to feel protected? That movie that Tyler Perry made, and I wish I knew the name, is Temptation of Something. Seeing that scene in the movie, and this is around when me and you first started talking, it sparked that conversation for us. When I asked Asha, what would you want me to do? How would you feel protected? Is it more important for me to make sure we make it home? Or to risk my life on the street to prove to you how much I love you. And when we got that clarity, now I know how to operate because now we're all operating out of the same value system. I value my life more than I value getting respect from somebody I don't respect. Or I don't know. Or I don't care about. And until we sit down and work through our trauma and we sit down and we have these conversations, we make ourselves susceptible to people being able to alter our lives in a blink of an eye. Will's life has been altered. He is now fighting for his career and his reputation because of a split second decision. So like I said, we don't make decisions and live with them. We make this we make decisions and we live with the consequences. So be mindful before you act. What are the consequences? What are the ramifications of these actions? Who is going to be hurt by this? What are the possible outcomes? And what are the chances of this being negative? Something I can't come back from. Because the moment you take your last breath, you ain't coming back from that. You get locked up for 15 years, you can come back for that. That's 15 years. You ain't been in your, this person you say you love. Life. You ain't in your kid's life. So just have the conversation, man. We got to make smarter decisions. Number one, we got to work through our trauma. Because this helped me see some trauma that I haven't worked through yet. I seen some real things and I'm, I I honestly am desensitized from what I saw. It wasn't traumatizing. It was shocking. I didn't see too much for that to be traumatizing. But I respect those who were traumatized by it because, like I said, we all got different experiences in life. We all got different capacities in order to handle challenges and adversity or certain stressors. But, man, I don't know. Um, I think the biggest takeaway from this, I would say, is that coming, well, speaking on topic as a black woman, I think the the main thing should be understanding our struggle and our pain and our triggers so that you can be able to not only uplift us in those moments and let us know how beautiful and important we are to not only you, but to the world so that when we are in situations, we don't feel like, oh, who's going to defend me? Who's going to be there and show up for me? We already know because you've shown that to us every single day. And it didn't take for a negative situation to arise for us to say, you know what? He has my back. He's going to be there for me. He's going to defend me in my honor. We don't have to wait for those moments because we already know that. I think it's important for us to feel all of that on a daily basis. And I think it's important for in those moments where you do have come into those challenges or a situation like this arise that you understand that you do defend that woman, but you think before you act in her defense, like Devin said, because that decision that you make can change your life just like that. So have those conversations. 
I'm sure we all have been having the conversation after the things have had have happened, but have those serious conversations. What is it that you will want me to do in a certain situation? How can I show you or how can I be there for you? How can I encourage you in that moment? How can I make you feel protected? How can we avoid this situation from happening altogether? On both perspectives, from the male and female perspective. Because what is it that I can do as a woman to make sure that I be there for you so that you don't act in a certain manner and it gets out of control? That I'm able to reel it back and understand that, you know what, you may be trying to affect me and it may affect me, but I'm not going to let you affect my, my man in the process and something happened to him because I need him here with me and I need this to be strong. And so I think having that conversation will open the door for us to just really understand each other better, understand what we need and hopefully help not only your, your relationship, but us, like I said, as a community so that we can really dig deeper and get through those traumas that we're experiencing because it all falls into similar categories. And fellas, if you had this conversation and she tells you, I want you to go to the furthest extent for any type of situation, run the other way. Run the other way. Because I'm telling you, if Asha would have told me during that situation, I want you to go all out. I want you to turn into a hawk and fight three dudes. I would had to reevaluate, am I with the right person? Because she ain't thinking big picture and she don't care too much about my life. I can't. Nah, you because guys. there's, there's going to be some women out there that's going to say, yo, I want you to handle your business. But I don't think it's a run the other way. I think it's having. No, no let me sir. let me say this, because I think it's about having a very mature conversation, because there are some people that will say that. And that is trauma speaking through them, because that's what they're used to. That's mm-hmm. what they may see. That may be the environment that they in that. You know what? If you do this, you love me. If you're willing to lay your life on the line, if you're willing to die for me, you love me. And that's the trauma that we've been brought up in. So be able to understand that if she does say that, but have that conversation to say, you know what, let's be realistic right now. What are the consequences of me acting in that de- in that defense for you to go to that furthest extent? Do you want me here to protect you in the end? Or if I do that and I'm no longer here, how is that benefiting you or our relationship or our family? So have that conversation, allow for her to see things from a different perspective, understand why it is that she would even want you to do that and talk about that. But that it all has to start with a conversation because there are individuals who feel like, oh, that is you showing up for me. Yeah, don't, but if you um, want to show up, you got to be there. I don't want you to show up and something happens. I want you to show up every day possible that you are able to be on this earth that God placed you here so that we can ride out together. So I think ha- it's just about having that conversation, opening each other's eyes to having a better understanding that things can be handled in a different way if we're able to, you know, discuss it and really have a clear understanding of how we can move so that we can avoid situations from arising. That doesn't need to happen. Well, thank you for speaking that so eloquently because <laughs> I, I wasn't saying if, if, uh, you bring up the conversation and that's what her go-to is. Like, I think that, like you said, you have to unpack why she feels that way. But if you get to the end of the conversation and she still has that perspective Mm -hmm. and nothing changes, if you have another conversation or another conversation, you might want to reevaluate what you are really doing because if somebody truly loves you, they don't want you to put your life at risk. Yeah. Like when I say that I want to do life with you, that means that I have to try to do what I can to do as many days in this life with you as possible. Mm-hmm. Not I'm trying to just be with you till I die. Yeah. No, I love you so much that I'm willing to live for you. And I'm going to make sure I do everything to live as long as possible with you. And putting your life in harm's way, putting our kids' life in harm's way, putting my life in harm's way when it doesn't call for it, it's not smart. That's true. But if it calls for it, just know we ready. We ready over here in the still house. So you guys, so we hope you enjoyed this episode. And until next time, keep it real. Yes, sir.